Hi, welcome to Virtual Worship with the Table, United Church of Christ of La Mesa. I'm Pastor Kelly, and it is great to welcome you here online to worship God and community. I'm currently pre-recording this. I am on parental leave until July 28th. I'll be back in worship on August 1st. But in the meantime, our members have lovingly and thoughtfully put together worship for you, and we have a great lineup of guest preachers, one of which you'll be hearing from today. It is an honor to be with you this morning. My name is Anna Runyon, and I am a former minister at Pilgrim UCC in Carlsbad, and I'm currently getting my PhD in leadership studies at USD. It's great to be back in the pulpit, thankful to uh, Reverend Kelly for making this possible. As we are seeing the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, preparing to re-enter the world, I have been contemplating how we might want to return. How do we honor the experience over the last year in a way that encourages, uh, encourages us to remember the lessons we learned? I invite you to join me in reflection today. Precious Lord, take my hand. I am weak, I am worn Through the storm, through the night Lead me on to the light Take my hand, precious Lord Lead me home When the Hi guys, today I want to talk about a word that I learned from Mr. Rogers, ambivalence. In the scripture that will be read in church today, um, we hear about people singing the praise of God after God brings them through some hard times. And I thought about the last year and a half for what feels like a long time we've had um, at home from church, at home from school, you know, not living life uh, how we were used to and how the coronavirus has affected us all and how it feels like it's kind of coming to an end. Um, and I feel like I, I read the scripture and I felt like maybe was I wrong for not being completely excited that the coronavirus is almost over? And I wanted to, to ask you guys how you were feeling about that. Because sometimes I think when we read the scripture, we feel like we have to be glad or we have to feel a certain way. But I think the ambivalence is important to understand here. Mr. Rogers taught me this word in one of his books. Um, it means that you can feel 
happy and sad at the same time. When we moved here from Ohio, um, Evelyn and Charlie, my kids, uh, were were really sad because we were we were moving away from our whole family. But they were also happy because we're moving to San Diego where there's a beach and a lot of fun stuff to do and the weather's always nice. And we, we found a wonderful church and we're meeting lots of new friends. So they were really excited, but they were also sad. I think that it's important to know that it's okay to be excited to go back to school this year, excited that things are opening up again, excited that it feels like the coronavirus is ending. It feels like that. I don't know how things are going, but it feels like things are getting better. But it's also okay to be sad because we missed out on some things. It's okay to have missed your friends. It's okay to be excited and it's okay to be scared too because things are changing and I don't know how they'll be uh, when school starts, but it looks like things are getting better. So I just wanted to talk to you guys about this word because I know once I learned the word, it made me feel a lot better about being happy and a little sad or scared at the same time and that that's okay. I hope you guys are doing great and I look forward to seeing you again. Good morning, my name is Gwen Olive and I will be reading Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and you did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. My heart may sing to you and not be silent. 
O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Our text for today comes from the first chapter of 2 Samuel. While the lectionary reading is quite long, I really want to focus on just the first couple of verses. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained in Zitlag for two days. David intoned a lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. We are emerging. After 15 months of isolation and distance burrowed in our homes, we are leaving our houses and entering those of our neighbors. We are eating at restaurants, shopping in stores, and going to the gym. We are hugging and kissing, and we are going back to the office. This long season is coming to an end. It feels like it's rushing to an end. Sometimes it feels like we're being thrust back into the world, expected to pick up where we've left off back to work, back to school, back to business as usual. But is that really what we want? Are we ready for that? I keep asking myself that this year has not been an invitation to live differently. The environmentalist Joanna Macy speaks of three stories of our time. There's business as usual, the great unraveling and the great turning. Business as usual has us has led us to a society built on oppressive, capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist economic systems. And this last year has been a picture of what the great unraveling might look like. The collapse of biological, ecological, economic, and social systems. As we are being ushered back into business as usual, we also have an opportunity to choose a new way. This year has shown us the interconnectedness of all life. We've seen how quickly the dominoes collide and collapse upon one another. We've also seen how quickly we can innovate to heal our world. It has been a year of experimentation and adaptation. We've had to create new ways of being together, of caring for one another. I wonder if we could build on this energy of change to shift all our ways of being in the world. In the great turning, we work to heal our world, our systems, our heart. Could this be a season of great turning when we can be intentional about going forward differently? What pandemic lessons can we take with us and what are we going to leave behind? For some of us, this year has been a year of slowing down. We've had fewer engagements, deadlines have become less pressing. We've been able to remember what rest looks like. How do we carry this forward? For some of us, this year has been exhausting. Doctors, parents, teachers, grocery workers, we've seen who and what work is truly essential in our society. We've seen how badly we prepared and supported many of our essential workers. We have a new appreciation and understanding of the work and the societal cracks that trip up our heroes. We have a new way of seeing the world. How do we carry this forward? How do we move forward and not forget all that we have seen, experienced, and learned? In a rush to celebrate the normalcy, I wonder if we're really ready to feel the joy. In our joyous celebrations, will we forget to grieve? The lectionary reading from 2 Samuel introduces us to David just as he's defeated his enemies. He won a great war, but instead of celebrating, he spends two days in lamentation. His greatest friend Jonathan and his greatest nemesis Saul perished in the fighting. The one who caused him the greatest turmoil and the one who brought him the deepest love had passed and he could not move on. He stayed two days to honor his grief before moving, going forward. And in this great lamentation, he praises both John, Jonathan and Saul. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. In his distress, he remembers Saul and Jonathan with sadness, but also with gratitude, praise, and joy. 
Khalil Gibran writes, your joy is your sorrow unmasked and the well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Perhaps we need to take a cue from David. We may have conquered or at least be on our way to conquering COVID-19. But before we can live out the fullness of our joy, let us take time to honor our pain to remember our gratitude for surviving and for those who made it possible for us to survive. If what we want to experience is the fullness of our joy going forward, we need to recognize the great grief that has been carved into us this year. To really live into the joy, we need to give ourselves first to grief. Truly, it is impossible to have joy without knowing grief, but I wonder if Taking time to sit with our grief might help us in the great turning. In our remembering, we will have deeper gratitude and greater joy. Malkia Devich Cyril calls this pandemic joy, a new kind of gratitude in which we honor the pain that we have experienced. They write, joy is not the opposite of grief. Grief is the opposite of indifference. Grief is an evolutionary indicator of love, the greatest kind, the kind that guides revolutionaries. Our grief is a reflection of our love and our capacity to grieve, to love, enhances our capacity to joy, for joy. And our joy increases our capacity to lead revolutionary change in our society. But how do we take time to grieve? What might that look like? Honoring our pain, our own pain, our pain for the world takes mindfulness, intention. On Good Friday, I facilitated a ritual inspired by Joanna Macy, where we took a bowl of water and for each pandemic season grief we were holding, we added a pinch of salt and said, my tears are for, and then spoke of the beings and places we mourned. I wonder if you could take some time today and embrace the grief of this season. My tears are for the many who have not survived this pandemic. My tears are for the distance and disconnection that we have grown accustomed to. My tears are for the traumatized health workers. My tears are for the exhaustion of holding our families together. My tears are for the fear of becoming sick or making someone sick. My tears go on as do yours. Take a moment this day to honor that pain. Malkia Devich Sira also writes, loss is simply an element of change. On the other side of change is loss. If we are to transform our society, if we are to cultivate the great turning toward freedom, we will necessarily experience grief. And in honoring our grief, we increase our capacity for joy. And this pandemic joy will be what carries us through to another iteration of what could be for our world. This grounded joy will be what gives us the energy to continue to transform our society. Let us cultivate our capacity for grief so that we may truly know joy and be nurtured to cultivate the world. You're bent, broken, and bruised Been opened up like a wound Had to grow up much too soon And it's all you can do To be sure there's nothing where you are that can leave another There's room at the table There's room at the
the table There's room at the table for you You've been lied to before Welcome above closed doors They say they don't but they take score Just protect this heart of yours Perfect imperfection is okay And if you're lost We will help you find the At this time in our service, I want to invite you to offer up your prayers. Take a moment to write your prayer requests into the chat. As we share our joys and sorrows, our joys are strengthened and our burdens are made lighter. In this season of contemplation, I want to invite you to bring your pandemic griefs and your pandemic joys to this sacred space, this beautiful community. And we pray. God of compassion, we bring you our pain, our personal pain, communal pain, and our pain for the world. You are the great comforter, and we ask that you make yourself present in this season. God of abundant and creative joy, we ask that you be with us as we celebrate the beauty of life unfolding. Take our joys and make them complete in your love. For those of us who are in pain, we pray. For those of us who are celebrating, we pray, bind us together and strengthen us to go forward, building your kingdom of love. Amen. Good morning. We have come to the time in our service we call offertory. Since we cannot be together physically to receive your gifts, we want to take a few minutes to prayerfully accept what is given in support of our church and its ministries. There are a lot of things going on that need our support. Our staff, council, ministry leaders, and many others continue to find creative ways to keep us connected and enriched each week. A few weeks ago, Ann Johns talked about our support of the Village of Promise that works with children of incarcerated parents. I wanted to remind you that this is the last week to send in your donations for their summer camp program. Remember to make a note of your donation that it is for Village of Promise. You can mail your donations for the Village of Promise or just to support the church to UCCLM at 5940 Kelton Avenue, La Mesa, California 91942 or you can go online to tableucc.com, scroll down till you find the yellow donate button and give via PayPal. However you donate, we appreciate your support. I found this poem from Frank Sonnenberg. It's called The Gift of Giving. Give out of love and not obligation. Give when it's least expected. Give without strings attached. Give from your heart. Give of yourself. Give to show that you care. Give help without causing helplessness. Give something that takes personal sacrifice. Give to make a difference. 
Give without keeping score. Give for no reason at all. Give a little or give a lot. Give without attracting attention to yourself. Give without being asked. Give of your experience. Give to those who need it most. This church has ministered to the community for over 50 years. It is a testament to the willingness of you to give and give generously. St. Francis of Assisi said, It is in giving that we receive. I pray, thank you, Lord, for the generosity of the people in our community. May they feel your love, support, and blessings every day. Amen. May the peace of God be with you as you go forward into your week. May the God of comfort hold you as you honor your pain. And may you find the fullness of your joy completed in God's love. May your joy be abundant as you re-enter the world in celebration. Amen. Oh.